Does everybody have a handout about Calvinism? Everybody's got one. Okay. Calvinism. Uh, start with Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Now, to be honest with you, I've never sat down with a Calvinist and tried to discuss Calvinism. Usually, my experiences with Calvinists is they try to take little pot shots at you on the way. Um, a Calvinist uh, thinking is uh, basically that they really think they're intellectual and they're sharp Bible students. That's what they think. And um, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. So, basically, with the Calvinist, generally speaking, a Calvinist believes that salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, then I'm not going to argue. You know, we can get along with that. Uh, Matthew chapter 10. But dealing with people. Here's another couple of verses we could use when you're dealing with people. Uh, Jesus said about his disciples. Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents. Matthew ten sixteen. Be uh, wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Okay, you know a serpent is a picture of the devil and a dove is a picture of the Holy Ghost. But a dove has a real innocent looking eyes, very innocent. But wise as serpents. It says in... Ezekiel, that Satan was wiser than Daniel. And then verse 17, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Okay, that jumps into the tribulation. Okay, let's pray and see if we can run through this thing. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to be faithful students of your word, and I do pray you'd help us to understand your words and know how to deal with people on this, on this subject. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, a famous Calvinist in the past is many of our forefathers, good men. Probably the most famous Calvinist was uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Big church, large church, uh, but he obviously did not preach on Calvinism very much. Okay, so a Calvinist, a difference between a hyper-Calvinist, now I didn't write this down here for you, but there are two... two uh, Belief systems. These both men uh, were around the same uh, time period. One is Arminian, and the other is Calvin. Now, neither one of these men actually put this belief system organized like this. This is how it kind of developed. John Calvin was like a Protestant pope, and then uh, Arminius. Was it James? Anybody remember Arminius' first name? Doesn't matter. Okay, Arminius was basically the free will side. Generally speaking, as far as uh, historical Christianity, will be your Pentecostals, your Methodists. Uh, Charismatics didn't come in play until the 1900s. Uh, let's see. Mainly, uh, as far as Protestant goes, would be your, your uh, Pentecostals and Methodists. John Wesley believed they can lose their salvation. They... Uh, mainly a focus upon the free will of man, where man of his free will accepts Christ, and man with the same free will can reject Christ after he accepted him. Very simplistically. Okay, as far as Calvinist goes historically, that will be your Dutch Reformed, uh, Baptist, generally your Baptist, and Presbyterians. They're generally the ones that were Calvinists. Now, if you ever meet with an Arminian, and tell him you don't believe in some of his viewpoints, he's going to automatically brand you a Calvinist. And if you deal with a Calvinist and don't agree with some of their viewpoints, they're going to automatically put you as an Arminian. They only see two groups. That's all they see. I have talked to uh, a guy down there. He used to be down the street from us as church, and he was an Arminian, and I was refuting some things he said as Arminian. Then he says, you're a Calvinist. I said, not, not me. I was predestinated not to be one. <laughs> okay, and uh, Calvinism is my roots, Dutch. Dutch Reformed. And now you're starting to see Baptist Reformed. Some of the Patriot Baptist guys are calling themselves Baptist Reformed. 
Now, if you want to see the extremes, go down to Madariville. You can have an enjoyable time knocking on doors down Madariville. You can go to Bailey Corner, Bailey Baptist Church, that's Patoons and Church. Okay, and so you go down there, you knock on one door, and there's a guy who's Armenian. They're called United Baptist. And go a couple doors down, and there's a Hard Shell Baptist. Hard Shell Baptist would be Hyper Calvinist. And United Baptist would be Hyper Arminians. Two extremes. One down there is named Jesse Bailey. He, uh, last, he's, he's dead and gone now, but the last I heard, he'd lived over 40 years without sinning. I thought that was pretty impressive. Okay, and uh, we let his crowd use our church a couple of times for a funeral, and they kind of preach in rhythm, those fellows. And I tell you, and the Bible says, hey, you know, and then the spit kind of starts coming over here. You know, that white little droopers there. You, know, you always want to wipe their mouth. Okay, then the hard shell Baptists are very small, very, very small group generally because it is some of the most boring material you ever read. Calvinism. Down in uh, Madariville area, there's one called Oak Grove Primitive Baptist Church. The door's unlocked. They are, they are consistent Calvinists. It doesn't matter if it's unlocked or locked because whoever predestines can walk through that door, they're going to go through the door. And they got a nice little cemetery right out front. And we were, Charles and I was knocking some doors in that area. And we talked to this one guy in his house. He's sitting there puffing on his ciggies and talking about the Bible. And he said, uh, have you seen that little church over there? I said, yeah, we drove up back there and looked at it. He said, you go inside? I said, no, we didn't do that. He said, well, let's come on, let's go and go on inside. I said, you go there? He said, no, anybody can go inside. And they had a sign that said, Oak Grove Primitive Baptist Church pointed this way, but the sign fell down, and so the arrow was pointing that way, so that was kind of rough. <laughs> But we walked on inside, and they had a couple pictures, and I think they have probably 10, 12 people, and they meet once a, son, once a month, and then they go to it. They find another primitive Baptist, another two hours away, and what they do is they do a round robin, so that way you kind of get a group of them. Okay, those are hyper-Calvinists. I talked to one of these ladies in Gifford, big metropolis of Gifford, and she was probably 60, 65 years old. And she told me she went to Oak Grove Primitive Baptist Church. And I said, oh, I said, when did you get put in Christ? She said, before the foundation of the world. I said, you don't look that old. 6,000 years old? <laughs> yeah. It never dawned on her. It never dawned on her. And she, it, it stumped her. She goes, if you go across the street, my son's over there. He can explain it better. So I went across the street, knocked on the door, and nobody was home. So I was predestined not to get the answer that day. So usually, you know, I can get along with the Calvinists with no problem. I can. They have a hard time with me, but I can get along with them. Uh, but if they always want to bring it up, always want to harp on it, always want to bring it up, that's their business, you know. And usually the clincher, in order to just get them off your back, if you want to do that, and just say, I'm sorry. I wasn't born a Calvinist. I cannot accept it of my free will. And God predestinated me before the foundation of the world not to be a Calvinist. And they'll just stand there dumbfounded. They can't answer that. Okay, so Calvinism. Uh, if you're dealing with a hyper-Calvinist, when I went to Grace College for two years, Grace College is strong Calvinist beliefs. I was playing, uh, I think we were playing Rook. Uh, or I was watching some guys play Rook in a dorm room, four of them. He was either playing Rook or some other game, board game. I forgot what, what it was. And uh, one of them was a missionary's boy, missionary child. And uh, they got discussed, talking, you know, just as they were playing the game. And one of them said, I got an F on the test today. The missionary kid did. And the other guy says, well, did you study? He said, no. He said, well, it didn't matter. It was predestined to get an F. I thought about that and thought about that. Now that's consistent. You got to give him credit. That's consistent. But sure is stupid, isn't it? It's like the Calvinist that fell down the stairs after he got down to the bottom. He dusted himself off and said, Boy, I'm glad that's over with. Like you have no say so in anything, none whatsoever. 
Okay, so Calvinism, as far as um, very simplistically speaking, they'll put it in a five-point outline. And being uh, the Netherlands, a strong Calvinist belief system, their flower is a tulip. And so there's the five points of Calvinism, tulip. And that's what you have in your little uh, paper there. We'll kind of run through some of those. Again, I have never sat down with the Calvinists and tried to discuss this for a, a length of time. A few years ago, several years ago, I said to my uncle, uh, my dad's oldest brother, he is a retired Dutch Reformed uh, minister, or Domini. And I sent him the Witch Bible track. I don't know why I sent it to him, but I just wanted to send him the Witch Bible track. So he wrote back and started asking me questions, and I answered him. And I wrote him back and asked him questions. So we had about four or five letters back and forth. I would answer my questions with the proper way and scriptural reference. And he would answer the question with a quotation from John Calvin. But he didn't answer about ten of my questions. I built up a list after about four letters. And so I just, the last letter, I just kindly wrote. I said, Uncle Bill, you're my uncle. You're, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. Uh, but here's ten questions that it doesn't seem to me that you've answered. Uh, it seemed to me I've answered all your questions. And here's the ten. I gave him a number. I said, if you can't answer these or if you choose not to answer these, please don't write any more. And that was the last of that. Okay, because they rely too much on John Calvin. Okay, so now here's, here's an extreme Calvinist. Somebody's extreme Calvinist is madly in love with themselves. Why? Here's the, here's the mindset. Who chooses to be saved? According to a Calvinist, who is the one that chooses salvation? God chooses who is to be saved, who is to be lost. Okay, but if God chose me to be saved, obviously there must have been something special. I must be worthy of his choosing. And so, boy, God sure got something special with me. And that's the mindset that develops. Okay, so a pretty strong conceit and think the real intellectual. But how can you accept a system that denies the free will? You can't. You can't accept it when the free will is denied. Uh huh. Oh, that's the elect. Yeah, that's that's exactly how they'll handle that. That's the elect. Okay, so we're going to run down through the five points of Calvinism. Okay, and uh, tulip total depravity. Now this is a very Simplified outline for this. Uh, if you want to get the entire definitive work on it, it's about that thick, hardcover. Uh, is that Dr. Vance? Or Dr. Vance has got that. What is it? Larry Vance. So if you want to get the whole scoop, if you're having a hard time sleeping at night, I would, I would encourage you to get that book and it would put you to sleep pretty fast. Anything about Calvinism put you to sleep. Okay, total depravity. Now, you, you and I would agree, yes, I believe that man is depraved. Okay, but their definition of total depravity is different to what you and I would say. A Calvinist believes the unsaved man is so dead in his trespass of sin, he is so depraved that he cannot even will to get saved. So whosoever will is out the door. You're so depraved, you cannot will. They do not believe in the free will of man. Look, if you would, at Ezra chapter 7, and there's other places you can run, but the Bible does teach that man has a free will. Herb Evans wrote one time about man's sovereignty over his will. Boy, that drives a Calvinist nuts. Ezra chapter 7, you can see in verse 13, uh, you can see right there about uh, close to the end, the last sentence, where it says, uh, which were minded of their own 
free will to go up to Jerusalem to go with thee. So there's a free will. Uh, verse uh, 15, you'll see the word freely offered. Verse 16, are they offering willingly? Verse 16, right in the middle, free will offering. So this is a Bible term, free will. Man has a free will. Now, we obviously understand that man has a free will where you and I accept Jesus Christ, but we also know that the Spirit of God is the one who draws us to Jesus Christ. You see, a Calvinist says it's all God, and an Armenian says it's all man. No, it's both. It's both God and man. It's the Spirit of God that draws us to Jesus Christ, but me and my own free will accept Jesus Christ. Now, what they might say is that, well, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't do that. Well, look at Song of Solomon. You say, well, it's got to be the Spirit that draws you. It's got to be the Spirit. The Spirit don't draw you. Okay, if the Spirit don't draw you, ask Him to draw you. Why can't you ask Him? And that's what I do a lot, is ask the Spirit of God to draw me closer to God. Song of Solomon, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4. This is the bride praying to the bridegroom. And she says, draw me. Draw me, we will run after thee. And so the idea is that a lot of times we don't even know what to pray. And so you pray, God, please help me to draw me to the right thing to do and say. Okay, so total depravity. Now, if, if a Calvinist says total depravity is just saying that man is completely depraved, okay, no arguments with me. I've got several verses that shows you that. Psalms 39, verse 5 and 6 says that every man is best state to altogether vanity. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Luke eleven thirteen. Jesus Christ said to his followers, his disciples, and you being evil, know how to give good gifts unto men. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost in Romans 7, 24, he says, O wretched man that I am. Present tense. And Galatians 1, 4 mentions the present evil world. But even though we're depraved, then we are responsible for our actions. If you and I cannot will to be saved, then we're not responsible for anything. If it's not up to us. Okay, so that's total depravity. Unconditional election. We'll spend a little more time on that one probably. Unconditional, meaning you, it is not, when they use the word election with salvation. And so you are, don't have any say so. It's unconditional. You are elected, meaning saved. When? Before the foundation of the world. It's not your choice, it's not my choice, according to a Calvinist. He believes a person is chosen by God in eternity past and was put into Christ unconditionally based upon God's sovereign grace. But the word sovereign grace isn't found in the Bible anywhere. Somebody made up the definition. I don't know. <laughs> because, I mean, those are all measurements of time. And eternity has no time. So that's uh, like a, a ludicrous concept to start with. I would agree. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1 is the verse that they'll run you to. Ephesians 1. Yeah. Ephesians 1, verse 4. And in the reference Bible, we've got a large footnote there about Calvinists. Ephesians 1, verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to him according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, I just read through that kind of fast. Okay, now, according to as he hath chosen us, chosen us in him, Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be saved. Is that what that says? No, you're chosen to be holy and without blame. Now, Calvinists, because they're madly in love with themselves, uh, they accent on the, the, the preposition chosen, or the, the words chosen us, me. He chose me, and that's us here. 
instead of focusing on Jesus Christ. See, if Calvinists will read this, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, where if you give Jesus Christ his preeminent place, you would say, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, a good verse to interpret that verse for you is 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. Scripture with Scripture, the Bible interprets itself. The thing is, you and I were not here before the foundation of the world. So technically, what a Calvinist has to believe is, before the foundation of the world, Christ chose me to put me in Adam, but yet when Adam sinned, I fell out of Adam, and now here I come along and get born, now I get saved, now I'm put back in Jesus Christ. So a Calvinist, if you take him to a full swing, he has to agree with an Arminian. Which is a problem. 2 Timothy 1, verse 9, it says, Who hath saved us and called us with a and holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Notice it's glorifying Jesus Christ, but as now, now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Okay, so unconditional election. Now they use the word election in reference to salvation. And what's our rule of thumb when we study the Bible when we look in, to define a word? You look for the word the first time in the Bible. And when you find that word the first time in the Bible, it will generally retain that definition throughout the Bible. Now, it may have a secondary or a third type definition, but it mainly will retain that definition throughout the Bible. The first time the word elect shows up in the Bible is in Isaiah 42.1. This is its first occurrence. Now, Calvinists will always associate the word election with salvation. You are elected to be saved unconditionally by God. But Isaiah 42, verse 1, he says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. Notice the word elect is associated with the word servant. Throughout the Bible, the word election is dealing with a service, not sonship. Now, this is how we use it still today. We have elections. You know, every two years, presidential elections, every four years. Okay, at these elections, do we elect people to become citizens of the United States? No, we elect somebody who is already to be a citizen to become a public servant. Because election is dealing with service. The choosing is dealing with a service, not a son. Jesus Christ was chosen to come to earth to give forth a service where he might save, seeking to save that which was lost. So after a person is saved, then God may or may not choose them for a certain calling or a service. That's what election is dealing with. Now here in Isaiah 42, the, the specific people that he's talking about election here is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is God's chosen nation to show all nations what happens when you disobey God or when you obey God. That's like God's pattern to all nations. And you can see when Israel falls apart in 2 Kings 17 and 2 Kings 23, when Judah falls apart, you can see that America is on the same cotton-picking path. We learn from history that men seldom learn from history. Okay, and election is in the Bible as far as Scripture goes, and I got all those other references dealing with service. Now, further down in here, it says, According to Calvinism, some 
innocent babies are elected to hell, which is contrary to Romans 9.11 and so forth. <clears throat> if God is the one that chooses who's to be saved and who's to be lost, then what about children? And I think this question was asked to John Calvin, and he just basically said, let's hope for the best. <clears throat> Can you imagine an instant, you know, like uh, last uh, December, December 24th, uh, Janet's niece gave birth to a little uh, boy, and four hours later he died, didn't have kidneys, died on Christmas Day. And can you imagine somebody comforting them and say, let's hope for the best? Where is the little fella? Well, it's obvious he's in heaven. Okay, but you know, Calvinists can't give that hope. How do we know he's in heaven? Because David said about his baby that died, uh, it can't come to me, but I can sure go to him. <coughs> okay, so that's uh, election. Of course, we're not going details on this thing. We'll put you to sleep if we do. Put me to sleep, probably. Okay, now, logically, if you believe in unconditional election, God chooses who's to be saved, who's to be lost, and this brings up the third one, the tulip, the L, that's limited atonement. Even though the Bible says Jesus Christ died for the world, actually, he only had died for the elect. <clears throat> okay, and how does this thing work? Okay, it's like this. Jesus Christ died for the world. He paid a ransom for all, according to 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. But the sad thing is most people don't take the benefit of it. If you had a guy who had buku bucks and he wrote a check out to every person on planet Earth and wrote the amount in there and signed it, and anybody who wants to take that and endorse it and take it to the bank and get the money can do it, but yet a lot of people just sit there and hold the check. Never sign it. They're not going to get the benefit until they sign it. Salvation's that way in that Jesus Christ paid the eternal price with his shed blood. All you got to do is take that personally and endorse it and accept Christ as your Savior. And it gives you eternal life. But you see, limited atonement. Look in 2 Peter chapter 2. This is probably the best verse you could show them. Showing that Jesus Christ paid for every person. Second Peter <coughs> two verse one. Limited atonement. Now under that we have uh, the phrase unlimited atonement is scriptural, and there's a bunch of verses where Christ died for the world. Limited atonement is a myth. Second Peter two verse one. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. Okay, false prophet, false teachers, would they be saved or lost? If you read down through the chapter, they're called natural brute beasts down in verse 12. Okay, so these would be lost people. And then it says, even denying, there we go, now we know they're lost. The Lord that bought them. Jesus Christ bought them, paid for their sins, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And then uh, the same book or letter, chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that. The elect should perish, but that the elect should come to repentance. That's how a Calvinist would read that. All doesn't mean all at all times. And of course, we know it's all. It doesn't mean all all the time. But uh, as far as uh, this goes, uh, they'd say all means elect. Yeah, and I know tree means a car, too. Not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. Limited atonement. It's a farce. And then if you have Matthew 11, if you look at that quotation from Jesus, Tyre and Sidon would have repented if they, God gave them the chance. 
Okay, this leads you to the fourth letter in the, in the uh, flower, irresistible grace. <laughs> Meaning you cannot resist the grace of God that's going to bring you to salvation. Now, anybody in their right mind can figure that out. Okay, Calvinists believe the Holy Ghost draws a man to Christ. I believe that also. And overshadows the elect to the extent that he cannot resist God's sovereign grace and salvation. I don't believe that. We know that the Spirit of God draws us to Christ, but man's part is the acceptance of Christ through his free will. Okay, so irresistible grace. Uh, remember where Stephen said, ye have resisted the Holy Ghost. So it can be resistible. Okay, and then you got other verses there. You can go into other areas. And then the last one on their, on their flower is perseverance of the saints, sometimes called preservation of the saints. They kind of go either way on those things. And you're not certain what they want to say, uh, believe, but if it's uh, preservation of the saints, that's what we would call eternal security. Once saved, always saved. Okay, then no problem with me. If it's perseverance of the saints, then they got a problem. That gets you into Arminianism. Now, one word that they use is the word predestination. Now, a lot of times you've heard that word, predestination. I think Brother, I think Brother Williams mentioned that once, predestination. But I didn't ask him what he was meaning by the word. Okay, it's only found four times in your Bible. Predestination. Romans 8 is one place and Ephesians 1 is the other. And I just see a typo. Romans 8, 29 and 30. should say 30 instead of 20. Under the second dot under preservation or perseverance of the saints. Predestination. <clears throat> Romans 8. Now, a lot of times you see a big word and, and it just glows, glosses over our mind. But you've got to think uh, simplistically. The English language, as Gail Ripplinger wrote, <coughs> is, is very interesting language. And often the definition of a word is inside the word. Predestination. What's that mean? Predestination. Well, we know what a destination is. And you have a predestination. And so when you go to an airport and you have a ticket, a plane ticket, you are predestined. To go over where the destination is. You're not there yet, but you're supposed to going to get there. <laughs> Predestination means something beforehand. So basically, and this is how the Bible uses the word predestination. Let's try the Romans 8 passage. Romans 8. It's not that he predestinated a person to get saved. Romans 8.29 For whom he did foreknow... He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. See, as a saved person, he's predestinated them to be like Jesus Christ, even though we're not like Jesus Christ. That we, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, there's usually three words that go together. Justification, something else, and glorification. And what's that middle word that usually goes with those three? Justification, sanctification, and glorification. And you notice it did include sanctification in verse 30. Why? Because... When you are justified by Christ, it is automatic you're going to be glorified. The sanctification is your part. You see, uh, some of your patriots and are Calvinists, some are strong Calvinists, you know, they're teaching now that Christ is coming back and there's going to be few saved at the rapture, or if you want to believe in that stuff. And so Christ is only going to come back for a spotless bride. No, He's not. He's coming back for a dirty, rotten, filthy, stinking bride. That's apostasy. Then we hit the judgment seat of Christ. That's when we get cleaned up. Every age ends in apostasy. It's falling apart. 
So as far as predestination goes, is dealing with our destination very simplistically is when I receive Jesus Christ, I am predestined to go to heaven. And I am predestined to be like Jesus Christ when I get in heaven. And the sooner the better. Ephesians chapter 1 is the other place where predestination is used. These are the only four occurrences. Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5, which we read already. But verse 5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. So at the moment you receive Jesus Christ, you are adopted as a son. In Colorado, in, a, in a, teenagers we had out there, there were three kids who were adopted, in this, and they kind of had a standing little, uh, not joke, but a standing a pact between them. And they would <laughs> say to the other kids sometimes, they'd say, well, when you got born, your parents were stuck with you. Mine chose me. And there's something to that. Okay, so you're adopted into the family of Jesus Christ by redemption, verse 7. You're accepted. Verse 6, you're accepted in the Beloved. And verse 11, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So the thing is that uh, at the moment you get saved, you're going to be like Jesus Christ someday, whether you like it or not. Here or there. But you're never going to be permanent like Jesus Christ here. We may have glimpses of him here. But looking forward to the day to be like him up there. Now here's a summary of two of this is how I wrote it out. <laughs> Since a man can do nothing, this is if you take a Calvinist definitions of all these. Since a man can do nothing to be saved, or to obtain salvation because he is totally depraved, incapable, God through irresistible grace will unconditionally elect the chosen ones because of a limited atonement. And that's why hyper-Calvinists do not witness, do not win souls, because God will be the one who saves them, and He's choosing who's going to be saved and who's going to be lost. And it's like this, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and you can stay and you can go. Uh, a Calvinist way of thinking is, is, a, is a coward's way out, to be honest with you. They don't want to witness for Jesus Christ. They just want to stay in their little cubby hole and say, well, my crowd's right and everybody else is wrong and I can't help it because God predestinated them to go to hell. And there was a lady several years ago. I, uh, I went to a farm auction uh, with Dad and Ronnie one time and this a long time ago. And there's a farmer from or down in DeMott area, and, and I got talked to him at the auction, Dad and I did, and he trusted Christ there at the auction. And his wife, I think, was a Presbyterian, and Dad tried to witness to her, and she said, I'm predestinated to go to hell. What do you do with something like that? Now, I would say, why don't you try it? Just to maybe hope you'd be unpredestinated. <laughs> Can you imagine a person feeling they're predestinated to go to hell? So here's uh, here's what I, you know, usually kind of, if a Calvinist is going to get smart with me, I just throw them at the bottom. Teaching Calvinism to an enlightened, a non-Calvinist is absurd because his or her free will is to choose is not valid. A Calvinist is born a Calvinist against his will. I am not a Calvinist because God predestinated me before the foundation of the world to not be a Calvinist. I can't help it. I am not an Arminian because I rejected that free will. I can help that. So you can work on both of them that way. And then what you're doing is you're dealing with an unreasonable person. And the second Thessalonians is you pray that God would deliver me from wicked and unreasonable men. So again, I've never sat down with a Calvinist to discuss this fully because they usually don't want to. But I've uh, talked to a few of them about other Bible subjects and they usually bring it up and want to kind of tweak you and just smile and go on with it. Forget it. <clears throat> but as far as the Patriot, the, uh, the Patriot movement goes, 
Calvinism, British Israelism, and Christ coming back in 70 A.D., which is really, really crazy. Those three are getting quite prominent. Just phenomenal. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to understand these things, your words, and I pray that you'd help us to <coughs> believe them words, whosoever will may come, and help us to invite people to come to Jesus Christ. But we need the Spirit of God to help us draw, or draw people to Christ. In Revelation, it says, the Spirit and the Bride say come. It didn't say just the Spirit. It didn't say just the Bride. Both work together so we can lead souls to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.